We're in Luke 1. We're going to resume our study. And again, what we're doing is we're not, we're not taking it verse by verse expositionally. I can't say that word. We're not de delving into each verse as deep as for say we are like Romans on Wednesday night or whatnot. But what we're trying to do is handle uh, each one of these situations that, that as they come. Um, each paragraph we might would say. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because it comes to your attention when you talk to people. And I'm not saying they're not Christians. I'm just saying that it happens in our country today that you talk to people that have heard the gospel and say they believe it. And folks, many times they've not read the Bible. It's a common thing. So especially the gospels, we need to get through these things. And it's important to spend time in them. And if you don't read your Bible at home, let me say this. The preaching of the, of the gospel will never affect you the way it does as when you have been reading your scripture at home and the Holy Spirit testifies to your spirit along with the spirit of the guy preaching it and things come together. That's how God works. So we're all responsible to read our scripture at home. It's a daily thing, folks. Don't go a day without the Word of God, okay? Now, let's start again in Luke 139. Let's just read this first section. Again, it says, Mary arose in those days, right after Gabriel told her, and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, and whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy Salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, back to where we kind of left off. John, we're told, if you look in verse 15, it says, uh, Again, this is Gabriel speaking to Zacharias in verse 15. He says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, John, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Do you all see the separation between two people in that verse? John is not a part of Elizabeth. John is a human being. And when did his human uh, existence begin? When he was born. At conception. Not at, not at birth, at conception. And there he is in her womb, and he's a person, and he is filled with the Holy Ghost. Now one would say, why would the babe in her womb need to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Well, I'll tell you all my opinion. It's for verse 44. Lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Y'all realize again, this is John's first prophecy, isn't it? And what has John in his mother's womb just announced? The babe, the, the babe that is to come. The coming of Christ. And this is what his ministry is all about. It's the announcement of the coming of the promised Messiah. And folks, this is what the Jews looked for all their lifetime. For 1,500 years they had been pining away for this. And here the time has finally arrived. It's getting near. And John's ministry starts there. That's why he's filled with the Holy Ghost. But do you notice that he was filled with the Holy Ghost separate from Elizabeth being filled with the Holy Ghost, wasn't he? Because he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. But here's Elizabeth six months later, for we read in verse... Uh uh, uh, 40. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. The babe couldn't have leaped if he wasn't already filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, this again proves this is two people. And again, I don't want to turn this into a, a, a statement about abortion because people, you know, look, let me say this. We are never called as Christians to go uh, march in front of abortion clinics. We're not called to do that. We're we're called to preach the gospel to those people. But is abortion a sin? Yes. And if it's a sin that you and I are guilty of, we need to realize it's a sin Christ died for, but we don't need to try to justify our having done it. We need to plead to God for mercy and, and see, thank God, we I ought to be cast away, and yet, look, He's shown me mercy. Okay? So don't, get, don't try and justify it with the rest of our country. It's not justifiable. Okay? Now, when John um, leaps in the womb. What is that for Mary? 
confirmation. confirmation. Folks, poor old Mary had been told something, and again, it would appear she has said nothing to Joseph yet. As soon as she's told, she takes off, and we know she's there three months, so she's there. I mean, literally, it must have just been a couple days, uh, you know, like three days journey is what it would take. So when she was told with haste, it says she took off for Elizabeth. And now she's down there, and she's got confirmation, hadn't she? And again, this poor girl shows up at home three months later, pregnant. I mean, y'all can see that everybody would just assume what she's been off doing. And so the angel again appears to Joseph to, to confirm Joseph and show him what's going on. But what I want y'all to see in this is Gabriel has appeared to Zechariah. He's appeared to Mary. Hey, Joseph's going to get a message. Uh, in a minute, Zechariah is going to be filled at the birth of Christ. He's going to be filled with the Spirit. And as soon as he's filled, what does he do? He prophesies. Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit. And what does she do? Testifies to the glory of Christ and God. Uh, the babe is filled. It leaps. Folks, this is the beginning of revival is the word we use, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, we're the Jews in an all-time low state. Yeah. Look, the Jews at this point in their history had been brought lower than they had ever been. Okay, And I, I say that knowing where they had been. Folks, they had been in bondage in Egypt. They had been in servitude to everybody in the promised land at one point or another. They had been under some of the worst kings ever. Finally, they had gone off into captivity. They had been to Babylon under a pagan regime. And yet I'm telling you all that when they returned from the land and God gave them their temple back, they began a descent that went lower than they had ever gone before. Had they descended into worshiping idols, sticks and stones before, but y'all know when Jesus Christ came, they didn't have any physical idols like Moloch sitting up there or Baal on it. No, they had a worse idol than they had ever had. What was the main uh, denomination that drove the thinking of the nation? They thought they could do it. Yes, they were Pharisees who, in, in their theology. They were Pharisees that thought they could work their own righteousness. So what then was their idol? Self. Self okay? So when Christ comes, they have reached a low point. They have descended to worshiping man. Now, where y'all think we're at today? We're doing, the same we're doing the same thing, folks. We think that man's intelligence and education and man's science and, I mean, for instance, we say, well, that Bible says this, but we know better than that now. Do we? This is not your father's father. Some of the difference today is, though, that they are actually admitting that that's what they're doing. Sure. Y'all know it's called humanism in, in, in some of its forms. If you're ever familiar with humanism, humanism is basically an extension of, do y'all know what deism is? Are y'all familiar with deism? That's God. God. Deity means God, okay? But deism is basically, it says, okay, there was a creator. Um, I'm going to say this again, and I know... I don't want to point anybody, but don't email me about it. I'm, you're not going to change my opinion on this, okay? Uh, I'm speaking to a good brother in Christ about it, but the founding fathers of our country, okay, were deists. Not all of them, but most of them. And what they believed was they believed in what they called the great architect. They were Masons, and Masons, you know, believe in that sort of thing. But they talked about the great architect, and what deism teaches, it teaches that a, an ultimately wise creator, a power, an outside power, created everything and kind of wound it up like a clock and put it into motion, and now it's working its way out. And they did believe one day the clock would wind out and there would be an end to it, but they didn't believe in a God that gets involved in everyday human activity. And read their writings, and you'll see that especially Thomas Jefferson. Folks, Thomas Jefferson edited his own Bible and took all the miracles out of the Bible. Miracle of the virgin birth, he removed all of those. So they were deists. Well, a deist can, can descend even lower than that because what humanism is, humanism teaches that no one created everything, that man has evolved from, from the nothingness, and we have risen up to this height. Look where we have come. I mean, we have crawled out of the mud puddle. Now, if you take that sort of thinking, you see man on an upward trajectory, don't you? 
But what does the Bible show us on? Amen. Downward. Folks, the Bible is full of this. And every time God steps in and makes a change, it's never when man is at the height of godliness. It's when he hits a low, isn't it? And so the Lord came when Israel was at an all-time low. When do y'all think the Lord will come a second time over here? <laughs> Folks, we're there again. Okay? We're there again. Now, in the case of, of when the Lord showed up, Israel is at an all-time low, and he sends John out there. And one more time, what is John's message? The theme of John's message to the Jews was repent. Repent of what? Their Judaism is the main thing, folks. They needed to repent of their Judaistic religion. I don't mean the ceremonial religion God gave them that preached the gospel in shadows and types. I mean they needed to repre repre <laughs> repent of the Pharisees' religion, Judaism it's called. Okay? Now, what would it entail for someone to repent of Judaism? The first thing he would have to do would be what? Get rid of the idol. Well, he is his, his own idol. Oh. He had no idols in his home to get rid of. Babylon took care of that. He was walking around his own idol. Uh -huh. Hey, look, you know, they did a really good job. I don't know who they helped research, but they've got some really good biblical... Uh, uh, a presentation in the series, The Chosen. Have you all noticed how the Pharisees walk around? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> special clothes, and this is true, special everything, and they walk like this, don't they? And what does the people do? All the people as they walk by, what do they do? They stand back and they bow. They were the holy, holier than thou. You say, well, we don't have that in our country. Me and Lonnie had it. Me and Lonnie went to a church where it was like a rock star was coming in the back. Everybody got seated, and then they said, now stand. Didn't they, Courtney? And everybody stood up for what? For, the priest. for here come a herald with the crucifix, mm -hmm. and it's a young boy. He, I had a friend that called it a harem, and I didn't understand that at the time. And you look at it today, I, 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 I hate to present that thought, but folks, there's some horrible things going on in that religion. And yet, who comes out of the back of it? This man, a guy in front of him is carrying a white Bible, isn't he, Lonnie? White, do they read from it? No. no. They bring the white Bible out and they set it down to give the implication that what we're about to do is coming from the Bible. But how does that man come down the aisle? Mm -hmm. Like this. And what do all the people do? Amen. They all, wow, here, you see? It's the same thing, folks, and you can do that. Look, you can do it with a TV preacher. You can do it with anyone. You can do it with me. You can do it with any human being. You can elevate them to a position that they do not belong in. What is the position of the human being in God's estimation? We're all on the same rung, aren't we? None of us are worth saving. I knew an old preacher that used to say, we're none of us worth the gunpowder it would take to blow us into hell. That's the truth, isn't it? That's really the truth. But when Jesus Christ came, Israel was elevated, weren't they? And do you know what the prophecy said he would do when he comes? In Luke, we'll, we'll read it in a few weeks. It says, this child is set for the fall and rise again of many in Israel. Why did the fall need to come first? Because you have got to be humble before you can believe the gospel. And this is what this is all about. And look who God brings the Christ into the world through. The most humblest of young girls. Folks, Mary came from the most meager city. She came from the most meager family. And she's royal lineage. And yet what had they been reduced to? nothingness. And again, compare Elizabeth. And I'm not saying Elizabeth wasn't, a, wasn't just with God. She was. But Elizabeth was married to a priest. She lived right near Jerusalem. Elizabeth was a picture of the old covenant. And yet what was she? Barren. Could she produce fruit? No. By the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a transition, aren't we? We're going from the old over to the new. And who is it that begins the transition and is doing all the work? The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit goes to work in Elizabeth. The Holy Spirit goes to work in Mary, in Zechariah, in Simeon we're going to read. You know, if any of y'all like to read church history, I love reading about the revivals that took place over in, uh, in Scotland and Wales and England. Anybody like to? Mr. Bailey I know likes to read that. You know, they all have the same thing in common. The Holy Spirit goes to work. 
and the Holy Spirit goes to work on differing people, and it's hardly ever the royal class, I mean very few, and He goes to work on them, and the same kind of things begin to take place, and it's amazing that you find out what's happening over in England in 1738. Somebody says, well, that's just emotional, it's not real. The same exact thing's taking place in New England in the same year. Now explain that. Had Whitfield never met uh, Edwards till years later, and they're all having the same events. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to work. Well, was it not a revival amongst the Jewish people when Christ showed up? And yet the revival starts with John. You remember multitudes were going out to John, weren't they? And what did John tell them they needed to do? Repent. Repent. Now, why did he tell them that? We just read it in Leviticus 26. The law was given to them, and God said, if you serve me and worship me, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll curse you. And down at the end of chapter 26, there was that clause. If you shall confess your sin and the sins of your fathers and your people, if you will acknowledge that everything that happened to you has happened to you because of your own doing, that I have been just in my dealing with you, then I'll turn to you. And so the Jews that went out to John went out there confessing their sins, didn't they? and the sins of their fathers. Folks, they weren't confessing. Look, I couldn't come forward and confess. The Catholic idea of confessing sins is each individual sin for forgiveness. Which one of us could get it done? We'd spend all day on our knees confessing, and while I'm confessing, my sins are growing because my mind wanders. And I have to say, sorry, Lord, I just, my mind went somewhere else. I don't love you with all my heart. You see what I mean? How could I confess the sins of my father? But could I confess that we as a people have turned from God? Yes. yes. We as a people have brought this on ourselves. And that's what Daniel did in Daniel 9, thinking it was time for the Messiah. And Gabriel was sent to tell him not yet. But it's exactly what John's telling the people to do. And John adds something to it. He tells the Pharisees, you bunch of vipers. You bunch of snakes. Who sent you out here? Who told you to run from the wrath to come? Who warned you? And he told them, he didn't want to hear words. He said, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Now, that's just another way of saying, I don't want lip service. Let's see some true repentance. What would have been the first sign of a Pharisee truly repenting? Going for a He'd have got out of them Pharisee clothes and got down in the Jordan River with the rest of them. Was that Pharisee going to get down in there with Mary Magdalene? Well, why not? Because he's above her. Because he's above her. Do you all see the whole picture? Now, Mary Magdalene's in the water. The drunks are in the water. The fishermen are in the water. And the Pharisees are standing up on the bank just inquiring as to what's happening, aren't they? And that's the picture. So, what the law produced ultimately was either a broken sinner or it produced a people self-righteous. And that's exactly what it did, didn't it? Now, what man's religion has done again has produced a self-righteous people, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, how many times do you all know people that say they're Christian and the whole idea of being a Christian is they're better than someone else? Look, we ain't better than anybody. We're blessed more than other people, not better. Christianity. Exactly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. I know I've told y'all the story. It's the best picture ever. When I went into a nursing home one time and I walked in and they had just finished bingo and an old fellow in a World War II hat turned around and said, what you here for? You know, what's the next activity? And I said, well, I'm here for Bible study. And he squared up with me like we were going to fight and he grabbed his wallet in his back pocket and he said, okay, I'm ready. You see what he thinks Christianity is? He thinks it's those men on TV begging for money and all that. So whenever we look at Elizabeth and John, John testifies that Christ had come. And what's the first thing Christ came to do to his people? To humble them. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Hey, you read the Beatitudes and you see someone that has realized their spiritual condition, that has seen their absolute contrary nature to God, that mourns about it, and that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Now, does that sound like the Pharisees? No. no. And it doesn't sound like a lot of people today. Hey, you know, people today believe that they're saved. You hear all kind of crazy reasons when you start talking to them. I thank God when you run into someone. Who, you know, uh, I was just talking to this uh, nice lady over here, and she said, hey, we met some Christians down at Orange Beach. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. And we, I mean, got the prayer. Isn't it wonderful when we meet one? I talked with Jean, and she said, oh, a Christian lady came into work today. 
Yeah. Wayne tells me all, he said, you know what? I asked a lady the other day if she was saved, and she turned around and looked at me, and she said, yes, I am. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died to pay for my sins. When we hear that, doesn't it bless your heart? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? So then when Mary gets there, she gets confirmation from Elizabeth. And watch again what Elizabeth says. Verse 42. She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now, uh, you know, again, growing up Catholic, that's part of our Hail Mary, isn't it? But did she say anything about her being the mother of God? Y'all know Mary is not the mother of God. Watch the next verse. Whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, I make this distinction when I say Mary is not the mother of God. Folks, God refers to deity. Mary is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ in His flesh. But turn to John 17. You know, if we to make the separation, let me put it this way. And the reason I say this is because we were taught to pray, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Now that indicates that Mary brought forth God. Yeah. No, it's, it's, that's blasphemy. Mary brought forth uh, the Lord's body. Mary brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Was He a human being? Yes, but what was He also? The Son of God. Did she bring forth the Son of God? She brought forth the Son of God in flesh. She did not bring God into being. Let me say that. Watch what he prays in John 17, 5. The Lord is praying and he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Folks, Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. What He did was, when, when He came down, the, uh, the Son of God humbled Himself to take upon Him flesh from the womb of a sinner. How much more humble can you get than that? God stooped down and joined us in flesh. Folks, did the Lord Jesus Christ hunger? Yes. Did He know what it meant to need sleep? Yes. Temptation? pain? Did He cry? Yes. Folks, God Almighty stooped down so far as to join us sinners in the likeness of sinful flesh. I, I can't imagine a, a love like this, but this is what He did. And Mary provided Him a body, didn't she? That's why the writer of Hebrews quotes the Old Testament and he says, of Christ speaking, it says, Wherefore when He cometh into the world, He saith, A body hast thou prepared me. Not created me, you prepared me a body. It's the same thing we read when they set up the tabernacle or the temple, and what would be the last thing that would happen? The glory of God came into it, didn't it? Okay. All right, now, um, Elizabeth is the first person that actually with her mouth confesses that Jesus is Lord. First one. And yet John did it before without words. He leaped in the womb, didn't he? All right, now, um, no man, according to Paul, can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Now, what Paul means is no man can call Jesus Lord in truth and sincerity. Can someone just use the words? Because Christ said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. See, you can profess something that your mouth and, and your head believe, but your heart is unmoved about. What he's talking about is no man can in truth do this. So how did Elizabeth do it? Holy Spirit. How do me and you get saved? The convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, you and I cannot believe on the Lord Jesus Christ without the Spirit of God. We are born dead in sin. Look, don't ever forget what I'm about to write on the board. The Lord said, No man. Now, how many does that include? All. All. No man can. I know we've covered this recently, but let's do it again. What does can mean? Able. No man is able. You know, we use can. We get it kind of messed up. I've told you all that I had a fourth grade teacher. I'll never forget. Miss, you remember Miss Davis, Gina? I would say, can I go to the bathroom? And she would say, oh, I bet you're marvelous at it. And I didn't understand. She said, I bet you're just one of the best at it, Troy. Yeah, I bet so. See, what she was trying to show me is I shouldn't be asked, can I go? Mother, I'm able to go. Mother, may I? May I go, right? Permission. So when we speak of can, no man means all humanity. 
No man can. No man is able. Okay. No man can come to me. Now look, come to me in the context. It's in John 6 where a whole bunch of them had come to him. And yet most of them were wanting free bread, weren't they? Remember he fed the 5,000? And then what did they come back and say? Hey, show us a sign. Uh, Moses made bread come down from heaven. They wanted to make him a king. You know, people today vote, well, let's see which one's going to give me the most free stuff. That's kind of the same attitude. So they wanted to make him a king and they wanted to get free bread. And Jesus told them, you're after the bread that perishes. He said, but there's a bread that doesn't perish. He said, I am that bread. And when he started talking about they better partake of him, what did the most of the people that come to him do? They went away. He's not saying actually physically walk up to me. He's saying no man can be brought to me under the conviction of sin and be saved unless. Okay? The next word is accept. And accept, of course, is a stipulation. We agree with that? All right, so if I wrote it like this, let's make this be part A. Okay? Can A happen? It is impossible unless B happens. Do we all agree? No man can unless. Unless what? God. Draw him. How can a human being in his natural born lost state go out and seek after the Lord in truth and conviction? He can't. Paul said, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. If something is spiritually discerned, what have you got to have to discern it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And Jesus says in the same chapter, John 6, he said, it is the Spirit that quickeneth. Quicken means make alive. What are we all born? Dead in sin. He said, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Folks, look, this is the flesh. No man can unless God. And so what we've got happening in the case of Elizabeth and Mary is we've got a picture of that. No man can unless God. And when the set time come, what did God do? He began to go to work just like he had promised. And that's exactly what Elizabeth says. Okay. Now, um, you know, there's another time something like this pops up about Mary. Go over to Luke 11. I'm thankful that Luke puts all these details in there because he, he really, more than any other writer, he is real accurate about uh, times and things that took place. <clears throat> in Luke 11:27, uh, we read, It came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. Now, was, Elis um, was Mary blessed of the Lord? Yes. yes. He's not saying, no, Mary's not blessed. What he's saying is, if when you hear this story of the gospel, that's what you focus on, you're missing the point. He said the true point is 28. He said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Mm. Right? So then we read, flip back over to Luke 1 again. In Luke 1 45, we read, Blessed is she that believed. Did Mary believe? Yes. And so, is Mary blessed? Yes. Well, when he says over there, blessed is he that believes. Look, I could read this verse right here. Blessed is she that believes. I could see, blessed are you if you believe. Not that you're going to uh, bring forth Christ in the flesh, but is there a conception that takes place? Yes. What kind of a conception? Spiritual. Spiritual. Yeah, you become part of the body of Christ by means of the new birth, don't we? Mm -hmm. So blessed is everyone that believes. And the great part about it, Jesus said when he started speaking in parables, he said, look, I'm speaking in parables. He, I heard a preacher once say that parables were a great teaching tool that Christ used to teach the multitudes. That's absolutely not true according to Scripture. According to Scripture, it says he began to speak in parables so 
that the disciples, the apostles would understand and the crowds wouldn't. And so as he began to speak, it says that he's, he's telling them these parables and they come to him and ask. He said, look, the reason I'm speaking this way is this. He said, it's given unto you to know the things of the kingdom of God, but unto them it is not given. Y'all think about that for a second. It? What it? The Spirit of God. Folks, we cannot discern the things of God without the Spirit of God. And he said, it's given unto you to understand. And then he said, to whomever much is given or to whoever it's given, what happens? They receive more. He said to those that was not given, they lose even that which they think they have. You know, he would speak those parables. It was amazing. As a believer, when you read that, it's so clear when he, at times he's getting down on the Pharisees, isn't he? And yet the Pharisees walked away and they said, I, I think he was talking about us. You see how they couldn't see it, could they? And yet the believers could. Well, was Mary a believer? Yes. She had, and she comes to Elizabeth, and what does she leave with? She leaves with more. Elizabeth was a believer. She had, and she, it, it, Mary leaves her with more, doesn't she? But you know, thank God for Zechariah. Old Zechariah had not as strong a faith as the two ladies, did he? So many times, that's the case, folks. You meet so many times in classes where women are women of faith and very few men. I, it's sad, but that's how it is. But Zacharias didn't believe. Did it change God's choice of Zacharias? He's called a just man, isn't he? But what did it bring on him? chastisement. And yet when uh, I told y'all when Elizabeth looks she says blessed is she that believes and Zacharias he's at there in his house again he, she could have looked at him and said yeah well blessed is the one that believes right? But what did even that visit of Mary do for Zacharias? It helped him. Folks Zacharias was chastised. I mean Mary this young teenage girl had more faith than a man that had served in the priesthood his whole life. What do y'all think kept Zacharias from believing as strong as Mary did? The impossibility of what was going to happen. We, yeah, but you know, Mary believed a more impossible thing, didn't she? Yes. Didn't Zacharias at least have a precedent in the Scripture? I mean, Sarah had conceived, Rebecca, Hannah, right? So he at least had precedent. What was... If we compare Zechariah's unbelief to Mary's belief, what would you say was the difference in their life? It was pride. A life, life of religion. A life of religious pride. And I don't mean he was lost. What I mean is he had been serving in that Jewish religion so long that he struggled to believe those things. Do you all remember what kept so many of the Jews from believing? They said, Nazareth, no, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. The Scripture says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, the Scripture does say that, but it never said where he was going to live as an adult, did it? That's like you were talking a while ago, where everybody's from. Yeah. Hey, you know, it's, it's, I mean, literally, it's, I've told you all in our terms. Uh, hey, all don't, do you all remember, it used to be when I was young, I remember it was a big joke for people to talk about Toledo, Ohio. You all remember that? Yeah. It was like seen as the worst. I've never been there. I'm sure it's a nice place. But people would say Toledo's the armpit of this or whatever, right? It, it would be like saying Jesus Christ in those days was from Toledo. <laughs> it, Nazareth was a nothing town. I mean, it was at, still today it's not much. But the thing that kept the Jews from from not believing on Christ for the most part was their own wrong perceptions about the Scripture. Hey, go over to John 5. Now, if we think we understand a verse, or we think we understand science, or we think we understand anything, and the angel Gabriel stands before us and testifies to something different, what do y'all reckon we would need to do? Look, I'm not telling y'all Gabriel is going to appear to us. I'm not, I don't mean that. I just mean, if science tells me this is how it is, and God says that's not how it is, even though I've been raised with my understanding of science, what do I have to do? I say, well, you know what? I've been wrong, right? The Jews were not willing to do that. In John 5, 39, the Lord told them, He said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. See, the Jew could not see Christ in the Scriptures. 
Let me ask y'all, when you read your Old Testament, you get saved and you go through. I know Maddie's working her way through the Bible, and she told me she's going through the Old Testament. Maddie, did those stories make more sense to you when you look for Christ in them? Oh, yes. Yeah. Don't they, Courtney? What you begin to find out, I mean, you begin to find out, oh, wait a minute, I see this high priest with those stones going in there. This is what Christ did for us. Who, this Jonah and the whale. Don't you, I always picture a young Jewish guy in Sunday school, as we would call it, but he's sitting in synagogue and he's wondering, why is this story in our scriptures? This man swallowed by a fish. I mean, this ought to be in the fairy tales, not in our scriptures. He don't understand. Well, who explained it? Christ. Christ said there's a sign. In, in Jonah was a sign. It's a sign of Christ, isn't it? They wouldn't recognize Christ in the Scriptures. Therefore, he told them this. He says, verse 44, How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Folks, the Old Testament Scriptures are pointing us to Christ. And not only in type and shadow, but they're pointing us to Christ in the fact that the law is a schoolmaster, isn't it? What does the law teach us if we're sincere? The I can't do it. I can't do it, isn't it? What did the Pharisees say? We've done it wonderfully. They twisted and turned it. You know, if you read the Pharisees' traditions, they added hundreds and hundreds of traditions that the law never said. Uh, Y'all ever read this? Y'all know that they would not eat an egg that a chicken laid on the Sabbath? Yeah. Serious. Where's that at in the Scripture? But you see, to them that was added holiness. Me and Gina grew up, and nowhere in our Catholic doctrine have I ever found it written, and I've looked it's in days since, but if we passed by a graveyard and we didn't do this, we weren't, you know, holy and righteous. Well, it's why? You add those things. You add those things for effect. But what did they do with the meteor parts of the law, according to Christ? He said, you've made them of none effect. Folks, they taught ridiculous things. For instance, thou shalt not commit adultery. They said if there were not two witnesses that caught the man in the act, the man couldn't be, couldn't be an adulterer. I mean, seriously, see how, right? But when they caught the woman, they brought her forth, didn't they? And, and you can just find lots of these things. And I've given you all the analogy before. Did God give them that law to be followed for righteousness? He gave it to them to cut them to the core, didn't he? he I, one, my, when I was growing up, you, couldn't, you didn't have 20 fillet knives because they were expensive and just money wasn't like today. Lonnie, you remember the one good knife with the wooden handle? My old man had one good fillet knife with the wooden handle, and he went out and caught a mess of fish. We came home, and he put that knife down on that, and as soon as it touched that white trout's throat, I knew I am in trouble. He started doing this, and it wouldn't cut. He picked it up and looked at it in the sun and he immediately started hollering at me. Y'all know what I'd done with that knife? Me and my buddies had been out there in the woods and I'd been out there whittling and carving. You see what I did? What did I do? I took the edge off his blade. His blade was designed to cut and I dulled it where it wouldn't cut. That's what the Pharisees did with the law. They dulled it to the point where it didn't convict the Jews and empowered them to think they were self-righteous. So in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus Christ shows up and He immediately begins correcting that. Y'all read it. He said, You have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Ain't that how He says it? Consider what He said. Hearsay. You have heard that it hath been said. See, most of the Jews couldn't read and write. They would go into the synagogue and they would listen to it preached. Y'all know 200 years ago in our country it was a lot of people couldn't read and write. So they were dependent upon the teachers, weren't they? He said, you have been taught that the law says this. He said, but I say unto you. Now who was saying it? The one that wrote the law. Christ himself. He said, if you've even had hatred in your heart towards your brother, what are you guilty of? murder. He said, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? What did he say? He said, if you've looked on a woman with lust in your heart, you're guilty. Y'all see what he was doing? He was taking that law that the Jews had dulled down, it wasn't cutting them, and he was wetting the edge on it. And I mean, when you hear that, I remember as, as a, a Baptist hearing that, and I knew that day, what? That shocked me. Wayne, did that shock you when you first heard it? It really shocked me. I said, what? 
wait a minute, thou shalt not commit adultery, but to even look on a woman? I mean, if there's a man in here that's going to say he's never looked on a woman, then I'm going to tell you, you just broke two commandments, <laughs> right? <laughs> the point being is it's in our nature, and without even thinking we look, don't we? And, and it, I'm not making an excuse and saying, well, we ought to look. No, we ought to look away. But what Jesus did was he put that edge back on the law, and he began to cut them with it. And that's what the law was designed to do. And it's exactly what John was sent to do. Folks, John was a herald, and the first thing he tells the people, is you're not righteous and you're not special with God, you better repent and get down in the water. Now what did they symbolize by getting in the water with John? I need washing. Don't ever say John's baptism was a Christian baptism to get someone into the local church. There was, there's no truth to that. John's baptism was an outward confession visibly in front of everybody of I'm dirty and I need cleaning. And the Pharisee was not going to get in the water with him, was he? Hey, so when, when she testifies about these things and she says again, look back over to Luke 1. In verse 43, we've got another wonderful thing about Elizabeth. She calls Mary the mother of the Lord. Notice she says, my Lord. Where would she get language like that? Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, y'all know it's amazing. It, we're, we're not going to get to Mary's song today, what they called a magnificent. Mary quotes at least eight books in the Old Testament in that song. Folks, Mary knew the Scriptures. You know, the Jews trained their, their children by songs, and it's a good way to do, isn't it? Songs stick with us and we remember them, don't we? Well, Mary was raised knowing these scriptures. And yet Zechariah, the Jew priest, couldn't believe like Mary knew. See, Mary believed in simplicity, didn't she? And so whenever Elizabeth testifies of Mary, she says that you, you were the mother of my Lord. Do you all remember what David wrote in Psalm 110? The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. You know, that's one of the Holy Spirit's favorite verses. It's quoted more than any other in the New Testament. Sit at my right hand. And Jesus questioned the Jews one day. They were questioning him, trying to trip him up, right before he's crucified, a couple days before in the temple. And he says to them, it's in Matthew 22, he said, well, let me ask you a question. Who is Christ? Whose son is he? The Messiah that you're looking for, whose son is he? And they say he's the son of David. Were they right? Yeah. yeah, he's the son of David. Folks, he was of the genealogy of David, wasn't he? In the flesh. And Jesus said, okay, good. Why did David call him Lord? Look, ain't nobody calls their child Lord, do they? You see what he was trying to show them? Christ is more than just flesh. He's the Son of God come in the flesh. And when she says, you have given birth to my Lord, that's exactly what she's talking about. The Holy Spirit says, in Mary has come forth the man, Christ Jesus, who is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And Mary's bringing him forth. All right. Um, uh, let's see. This is the first, uh, lots of people do believe that this was a song, like I told y'all that Elizabeth sings, but it's actually, uh, there is at least four songs in here. This one that Mary's going to say, we won't start today, but it's called The Magnificent. And then we've got uh, another by Zacharias, and we got another by Simeon. Y'all remember Simeon sings the song? And Mary's song is a lot like Hannah's song. Y'all remember when Hannah uh, brought forth Samuel? And you remember the beautiful song she had in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2? And what you get from Mary is you get a song, and it's an amazing thing. Neither one of these women did what you would expect both of them to do. Did either one of them glorify the fact that they had been used? Did either one of them brag about the gift? What did both of them do? They brag about God. Both of them testify to the mercy and the glory of God. I mean, essentially what they've both said is God is doing exactly what He promised He was going to do. And if we uh, take Mary too before we go, the thing that Mary did that is to be admired. Now, again, we went over last week how, uh, you know, Roman Catholicism has lifted Mary out of her place and made her something she was never intended to be. And bless her heart, if, if she's not aware of it now, I don't know how that works, but when she is aware of it, she's going to be appalled at it, I promise you, because Mary, folks, said she needed a Savior. She said that this in her was her Savior, didn't she? So what Mary um, basically does do, though, Mary heard the Word of God, didn't she? 
You know, she could have not stopped talking long enough to even let Gabriel get a word in. He, uh, yeah, no offense to you ladies, but I've talked to a lot of ladies that I can't get a word in. I know there's guys like that too, but she, she stopped and she listened, didn't she? Did she listen with an open mind? Did she have her mind already made up and say, but hold on, I'm not from Bethlehem. No, she didn't say any of that. She heard, she believed, didn't she? Y'all know when she asked the angel, she didn't say, how can this be? She said, how shall this be? Big difference, isn't there? She didn't say, prove to me. Now, that's what Zechariah said. How can I know this? And the angel Gabriel said, well, I'm Gabriel. I've come from the right hand of God. Isn't that proof enough? But he, he chastised him, didn't he? Mary said, can you tell me how this is going to take place? Folks, she needs to know. She's a young virgin betrothed to a man, and he's just told her she's going to be pregnant with a child without a man, and she's essentially saying, well, what, am I, what do I need to do? She believed, didn't she? But what's the next thing she did? <clears throat> she obeyed. Think about it. You know, we can believe without obeying, can't we? She obeyed. Folks, we know she obeyed because she moves forward. She goes down. She sees Elizabeth. She, she separates from Joseph. Three months, whatever. She's there. She's obeying. But what does she do next? She worships God. I want y'all to, if you want to brag on Mary about something, brag on her about that. Mary is a great picture of a faithful believer. You want to lift her up? Lift her up next to Paul. Or lift her up next to, you know, Augustine. Or lift her up next to Martin Luther. Lift her up next to any other saint and say, there's a good example of a saint of God. Do not lift her up to a God. Do not worship her. Look at her as an example. You remember when the Apostle Paul told Timothy? He said, no, I'm sorry, he said to the Ephesians, where Timothy, they say, was the pastor later. But she said, he said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Was Mary a follower of the Christ that was in her womb? Yeah. She was. Wasn't that a great scene in The Chosen? I love it when they're sitting at that table talking. Hey, if any of y'all are unfamiliar with that, please watch it. Man, it's great. But they're sitting at that table talking, and Peter and the guys are trying to reconcile in their mind how that this lowly, peaceful Messiah can fulfill the prophecies that talk about him like he's a great warrior. And they can't reconcile it. And they said, well, how can this be? And Mary breaks in without, you know, she said, hmm, I know something about hard to believe prophecies. Mm -hmm. Think what she was told. Mm -hmm. Folks, she believed it, didn't she? And so when we look at the case of Mary, one more time, let me say it. Mary is not a mediatrix. Mary is not a co-redemptress. Folks, Mary is nothing more than a saint of God. That's it. That's all she is. But folks, does she need to be more? No. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly place in Christ. Hey, you know, I'm going to use the example, if y'all don't mind, of Wesley and Whitfield. John Wesley and George Whitfield uh, were, were used in the same revival in England. And Wesley came to America and he wasn't even saved yet. And he had zero uh, he, he did nothing. It just all fell on its face. He was in Georgia. He went back, and on a boat back, he, he got with some Moravians. And he realized those Moravians had something he didn't have. They come through a bad storm at sea, and John Wesley said he was scared to death. He was about to die. And guess what the Moravians were doing? Singing. Singing. It reminds me of that boat Paul was on in Acts 27. Y'all remember that one? And everybody in Paul finally stands up and said, we're all going to be okay. The Lord told me I'm going to Rome. Then what did Paul know? I'm either going to float on my back or it doesn't matter. I'm going to Rome, right? Well, Whitfield and Wesley had said, Wesley come home and he was under conviction. It lasted for a while. And he finally got saved one night at a meeting. He, he did get saved. But um, when Whitfield and Wesley, uh, I don't forgot what my point was. <laughs> I'm, <leaking>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I have to... I need my medicine, Maddie. <laughs> I can't remember what was the point I was going to make. I started thinking about Wesley being under conviction. I'm sorry, y'all. He, God used both of those men, and he used both of them mightily. But what it really come down to in the end is they separated over doctrine. Um, Wesley began to believe that you could become perfect and sinless while you're on earth. And of course, that doctrine led to another and to another to another to eventually it became Arminianism where you can lose your salvation. And he and Whitfield separated over that. But in the using of those
those two men, both of them were used by God. Both of them were, were the Holy Spirit was, was with them, using them and working through them. Both of them were used in revival. God fanned the flames with both of them. Both of them were very different men. The, the heated doctrine between them was really stoked and I don't want to offend anyone if you're Methodist in your background. Mr. Bailey, no offense. <laughs> but in, you can read in their diary writings, this was the point. Whitfield begged Wesley not to publicly talk about what he disagreed with him about. And it was about election and some other things. He said, let's leave that alone so we can both effectively preach the gospel. Now, folks, when you're preaching the gospel, it's better to be on the same page. Don't delve into the deeper issues if you differ on them. You can, we can all have doctrine different and, and be saved, okay? Not, not the cross different, but other doctrines. But in his diary, Whitfield kept begging Wesley not to do it. And Wesley essentially wouldn't do it. He kept pushing the issue. And Whitfield was asked one day by one of his helpers, he said, do you think we'll see uh, Wesley when we get to heaven? Now, y'all know what the man was asking. Yeah. He said, you know, in light of this trouble he's causing and all, do you think he's saved? Isn't it sad how quick we go there? Yeah. Folks, that's not, our, that's not our affair. That's God's affair. But Whitfield turned around and looked at the young uh, guy, and he said, no, I don't believe we will see him. And the fellow said, yep, yeah, that's what I thought. But before he could stop, Whitfield said, I believe that Brother Wesley will be magnified so far above you and I will hardly be able to make him out. You see his point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the point I want to make about Mary this morning. Mary is not to be worshipped. Mary is not to be prayed to, folks. Mary cannot do anything for you. Mary had something done for her. But was Mary a great saint of God? Yes. She's going to be magnified in heaven, not because she brought forth Christ in the flesh. She's going to be magnified because she believed and was used of the Lord. Okay? It's the Holy Spirit working in Mary, just like the Holy Spirit will work in me and you, if you and I will just surrender. Now, I don't mean that it's our surrendering that saves us. I mean, can a saved person resist being used of God? Yes. And you know what God will do? He'll use the next person, won't he? Mary heard something that sounded impossible to believe, and yet what did she do? Believe. She believed it. Didn't Abraham hear something similar? Yes. I mean, folks, that's essentially this. Does it not sound too good to be true yeah. that all my sins have been placed on my Savior and they have been washed away and I have been made white as snow. That sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But y'all know this book says it over and over. So whatever my past theology says, I'm going to have to say, well, I'm wrong and this book is right. Okay? All right, any questions? All right, well, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father, thank you for the wonderful promises that we find in your word. Lord, we thank you for the conviction of sin, for revealing to us what we truly are. Lord, let us never brag about our past sins or gloat about them. Let us look on them as what they are. They're a shame. And yet it's that shame that brought our Savior into this world, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation that comes through Him. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that applies these things, that convicts us, that shows us about righteousness and judgment to come. Please give all of us a tender heart for the lost, that we might have compassion on them and see. The only difference between us and them is that we've been saved and they haven't. Lord, please help us preach the gospel in truth and in sincerity. And Lord, help us remember not to say too much. Let us simply lay the truth of the Scripture before them and let the Holy Spirit do the work you promised you would do. In Christ Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen.